Thanks for joining me, Rene Fong, on News on 2. At the same event, Tun Dr Mahathir said Malaysia is unhappy with the latest report of MH17. He reiterated that Malaysia wants clear proof that Russia is behind the shooting down of Malaysia Airlines flight MH17. We are very unhappy because from the very beginning, it became a political issue on how to accuse Russia of the wrongdoing. Even before they examined, they already said Russia. Now they say they have it. So it's very difficult for us to accept that. Tunak the Mahathir said Malaysia wants proof of guilt that Russia did it. However, he said so far there is no proof presented by investigators, only hearsay. International investigators yesterday charged three Russians and a Ukrainian with murder over the shooting down of flight MH17. The Dutch-led team said the four men with military and intelligence links would go on trial in March next year, although they are likely to be tried in absentia in the Netherlands, as neither Russia nor Ukraine extradite their nationals. MH17 was shot down on July 17, 2014, over territory held by pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine as it was flying from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. All 298 people aboard died. Most of the passengers were Dutch. The joint investigation team comprised of Australia, Belgium, Malaysia, the Netherlands and Ukraine. In a related development, the Russian Foreign Ministry has expressed regret for being the target of completely unfounded accusations on its alleged involvement by the team investigating the Malaysia Airlines MH17 flight crash. The ministry, in a statement issued through the Embassy of Russia in Malaysia, said the unfounded accusations were intended to discredit it in the eyes of the international community. It added that the joint investigation team, JIT, did not produce a single shred of concrete evidence to back up its groundless statements. It said in a statement today that the JIT continues to put forward not entirely reasonable arguments, some of which are based on dubious information sources. It added that Russia categorically denies such accusations. The statement continued that Russia had been very keen in finding the truth and has been willing to help with the investigation in every aspect from day one. Russia also said it had actively cooperated with the Netherlands and presented all information it had on the MH17 crash. On Wednesday, international investigators charged four people with murder over the shooting of MH17, which killed 298 people. There are Russian nationals Igor Girkin, Sergei Drobinsky and Oleg Pulatov and Ukrainian Leonid Karchenko. On 17th July 2014, flight MH17 was shot down over Ukraine after departing Amsterdam for Kuala Lumpur. According to official information, the plane was carrying 193 Dutch, 43 Malaysians, 38 Australians, 12 Indonesians and 10 British passengers, as well as one from New Zealand. Prime Minister Tunak Dair Mahathir Mohamad today said Datuk Sri Muhammad Azmin Ali does not have to go on leave to facilitate the investigation into the viral controversial video implicating the Economic Affairs Minister. Tunak Dair Mahathir said a minister should only take leave if the investigation is related to wrongdoing, wrongdoing or crime, adding that the case related to Datuk Sri Muhammad Azmin is politically motivated. Other investigation on wrongdoings of crime, they can take leave. But this is a political thing. It, in fact, it is intended to embarrass him and to ask him to take leave. I don't like this political uh, uh, evidence. The Premier said this to reporters at the Prime Minister's Department, Hari Raya Open House, today. Tunuk the Mahathir said the investigation into the video could continue and Datuk Sri Muhammad Azmin, who is PKR Deputy President, would not cause any obstruction. Datuk Sri Muhammad Azmin gave his statement to the police on Monday pertaining to the video allegedly linked to him. 
Last week, he vehemently denied the allegation by an individual who attempted to link him to the sex video, calling it a nefarious plot to assassinate his reputation and character in an attempt to destroy his political career. The Parti Keadilan Rakyat PKR Disciplinary Board has given 14 days for Santubong Angkatan Muda Keadilan AMK Chief Hazik Abdullah Abdul Aziz to give a show cause letter regarding his public statement on the sexual video linking himself. Chairman of the PKR Disciplinary Board, Dato Ahmad Kasim, yesterday said the letter would be delivered today following the statement by Hazik which damaged the credibility and destroyed the reputation and personality of the party leadership. Dato Ahmad said the decision was among the four matters concluded by the board and presented to the PKR Political Bureau. Lembaga disiplin juga uh, ambil maklum penafian oleh yang berhormat timbalan presiden dan akan meneriti sebarang penyerahan sekiranya ada. Dan yang ketiga, Kami juga menunggu siasatan serta dapatan daripada PDRM atau pihak lain yang berautoriti terlebih dahulu. Dan yang keempat, lembaga disiplin juga ingin memberi amaran keras kepada semua anggota parti supaya tidak membuat kenyataan tanpa asas dan fakta kepada pimpinan parti. Dato Ahmad said this at a media conference after special meeting of the PKR Political Bureau chaired by Parti President Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim last night. PKR President Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim said last night that he would leave it to the police to take appropriate action against author Yahya Ismail, who threatened to publish a book disparaging Datuk Sri Anwar if he was not paid 400,000 ringgit, confirming that he had received the threat from the author of the book titled Mengapa Anwar Tak Boleh Jadi PM? Why Anwar Cannot Become PM? The Port Lixon MP said a police report on the matter had been lodged yesterday against the writer by Kedah PKR Leadership Council Chairman Datuk Johari Abdul. Datuk Sri Anwar was speaking to reporters after attending a Hari Raya Fellowship dinner organised by the Malaysia India Business Council MIBC, attended by some 200 guests. In addition, he said the person who wrote the book had been paid and hired and the time had come for the author to be known to the public, to be probed and for the appropriate action to be taken. At an earlier press conference in Petaling Jaya held after the conclusion of the PKR Political Bureau meeting, Datuk Johari said he had received the book manuscript on 10th June and lodged the report because the book was defamatory towards Datuk Sri Anwar. Saya telah membaca keseluruhan manuskrip buku tersebut dan mendapati ianya syarat dengan fitnah dan tomahan yang keji yang amat dahsyat terhadap Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim. Fitnah-fitnah tersebut berlega tentang tomahan pertama, homoseksualiti dalam page 7, 8, 9, 10, 77, 91 dan 107. Korupsi page 43 dan 49, Agent Zionis Israel dan mereka syarikat. A local woman died at 8.36 a.m. today while receiving treatment at the Port Dixon Hospital PDH as a result of methanol poisoning. This makes K. Ratika, 26, from Serting Jumpol, the second victim after the 27-year-old Myanmar man died last Monday. Port Dixon District Police Chief Superintendent ID Shah Mohammed said in a press conference today two other victims of methanol poisoning were still receiving treatment at the same hospital, with one unconscious and the other in stable condition. He said he was also informed of another new victim, bringing the total to five people affected by methanol poisoning. He added that the latest victim, a woman in her 50s, received treatment at the PDH yesterday before requesting to be transferred to the Tuanku. Ampuan Naji Hospital in Kuala Pila for further treatment. Aidi Sham said based on information from the victims, the alcoholic drink was bought from a retail shop in the Lukut and Chua area. Subsequently, two members of a family aged 50 and 19 suspected of selling the alcoholic drinks to victims were detained today at noon at Taman Indah Lukut. 
to help in the investigations. ID Sham said the case was being investigated under Section 304A of the Penal Code, adding that the police were now tracking down the male suspect who sold the drinks. He urged those with information on the sale of these drinks to lodge a report at the nearest police station immediately. The Social Welfare Department is currently investigating a report of senior personnel being abused at an old folks' home centre in Seremban, Negeri Sembilan. Deputy Women, Family and Community Development Minister Hana Yeo Siu Suan says a thorough investigation will be carried out before a decision on the case is made. The laporan saya akan dapatkan daripada JKM. JKM is still uh, siasat dan exco Negeri Sembilan telah pun turun untuk uh, melawat. Okay. The, the the laporan that I, I I read is that they have changed name. The owners, the names have changed. Okay. But I'm waiting for the official report. Then we will definitely update everybody. The Deputy Minister further encouraged more Malaysians to come forward and make reports on abuses. Speaking at the launch of the Empowering Women in Cyber Risk Management event in Putrajaya, Hannah expressed hope people would pay more attention to the lights of those around them. On Monday, Facebook user claimed that residents at the old folks' home were being mistreated by a supervisor. Pictures and videos were uploaded on the social media platform to back up the claims. Following that, former employees of the home claimed residents were forced to drink their own urine and fed extra sleeping pills. The owner of the old folks' home has denied the claims. At the Petaling Jaya Sessions Court today, a husband and wife duo were charged for the offence of abusing two children aged 6 and 7 in Puchong, Selangor on 15th June. The couple respectively faced four counts of abusing the children with several solid objects causing bodily injuries to the victims. The accused as Gopal, 33, and Arani, 30, pleaded not guilty and claimed trial. According to the charge sheet, the married duo and their 13-year-old daughter were charged together for abusing the two child victims by beating them with rubber pipe and cable wire on the head, face, hands and feet. Moreover, all the accused also placed hot fork and knife on the hands, feet and bum of the child victims. Gopal and Rani were also respectively accused of neglecting the two victims, causing them to be chronically malnourished and anemic. If convicted, the accused can face a prison sentence of up to 20 years or a fine no more than 20,000 ringgit or both. Judge Norshila Kamarudin granted the accused an 8,000 ringgit bail for each charge. The court also ordered the accused to report themselves to their nearest police station once a month and were ordered to stay away from both victims. The court also set the case re-mention date on 29th July. Meanwhile, the 13-year-old accused pleaded guilty to both counts and will be placed in a child protection boarding school before the case resumes on 25th July. The Ministry of Finance senior official today told the Kuala Lumpur High Court that the documents for a memorandum to the Cabinet on the Government's Guarantee for SRC International Student Berhad must be prepared immediately as the company belonged to former Prime Minister Datuk Sri Najib Tun Razak. The Ministry's Strategic Investment Division Deputy Secretary Afida Azwa Abdul Aziz 44 said the matter was told by the Division Secretary Maliami Hamad after she questioned why the Cabinet Memorandum needed to be completed immediately. The 40th prosecution witness said this during a re-examination of Deputy Public Prosecutor Dato Suhaimi Ibrahim on the 29th day trial of Dato Sri Najib, who is facing seven charges of misappropriation of SRC funds totaling 42 million ringgit. The cabinet memorandum concerns a government guarantee for SRC to secure the two billion ringgit first loan from the Retirement Fund Incorporated, KWAP, which was eventually given on August 26, 2011. When re-examined by Deputy Public Prosecutor Datuk Suhaimi Ibrahim, the witness emphasised that unlike normal practices, where companies seeking the guarantee would write their own memorandum, she had to prepare the document on SRC's behalf for the Cabinet meeting. 
This led to objections being raised by Datuk Sri Najib's other main counsel, Datuk Yusof Zainal Abidin, who said Afida's evidence should not be admitted as it could be considered hearsay. The former Premier is on trial for seven charges in relation to criminal breach of trust, abuse of power and money laundering involving 42 million ringgit SRC funds. A farm worker pleaded not guilty today at the Butterworth Magistrates Court to the charge of driving under the influence of drugs causing the death of a nasi lemak seller on Sunday. The 30-year-old man was charged for driving his car on a public road under the influence of drugs when ramming into the victim who was selling nasi lemak at the roadside. The offence was committed at about 10 a.m. on 16 June at Taman Bertam Indah, Kepala Batas, Pulau Pinang. The accused was granted bail and 8,000 ringgit with one surety. The court also ordered the accused to report himself to the nearest police station at the 20th of every month pending case completion. In addition, the court said the case re mentioned to run on 22nd July. A misunderstanding over a girl is believed to be the cause of a fight involving a group of teenagers at the parking lot of a fast food restaurant in Sungai Isap, Kuantan, yesterday. Kuantan District Police Chief ACP Muhammad Nur Yusof Ali said the incident at 1am was believed to involve 12 teenagers aged between 19 and 20 from the district Pekan and Kangar Perlis. ACP Mohammad Noor today said a 20-year-old victim who is a student claimed that he was contacted by an unknown man at 8 p.m. the day before, who introduced himself as his ex fiancés uncle and wanted to meet him. He said the victim claimed that he and two friends were at the parking area when they were approached by a group of men in the three cars while one of the suspects asked for him. ACP Mohammad Noor said the man then allegedly attacked the victim and his companion. ACP Mohammad Noor said the victim lodged police report about an hour after the incident and claimed that the suspects caused his 19-year-old friend and himself to suffer bruises on their face, head and body. He added six teenagers aged between 19 and 20 were detained between 4.50pm and 6.45pm yesterday at the compound of Kuantan District Police Headquarters after being called to testify. He said an investigation was being conducted under Section 14 seven of the penal code which provides for a maximum jail sentence of two years or a fine or both upon conviction. A Mara Institute trainer was killed while three others were critically injured in an accident at Kilometer 7 Jalan Jurantut Temerlo nearby Kampung Temin Jurantut Pahang last night. In the 8.15pm incident, Mohamed Mazro Umar, 18, died while receiving treatment at the hospital Sultan Haji Ahmad Shah around 4.30am this morning. The three other critically injured victims were identified as Ruzaini Abdullah, 24, Muhammad Ayman Zulkifli and Muhammad Izwan Shafar Muhammad Izaini, 19. Jurantut Police Chief Superintendent Mazlan Hassan said the victims were speeding in their Ford Fiat vehicle before losing control and crashing into the electronic pole at the side of the road. Superintendent Mazlan further noted that the fire and rescue team had to be called to help remove the victim who was stuck in the vehicle. The Jurantut Police Chief added that the case is being investigated under Section 41, Subsection 1 of the Road Transport Act 1987. Women who have taken a career break to care for their families now have a chance to come back to the workforce through the Empowering Women in Cyber Risk Management Programme. Offered by Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, Sunan Berhad MDEC, the program is aimed at encouraging and bringing back women to the workforce in the field of cyber risk management. The program is also jointly organized by Women, Family and Community Development Ministry, Communications and Multimedia Ministry, National Cyber Security Agency, NAXA and Talent Corp. Deputy Women, Family and Community Development Minister Hannah Yeo said a three-month internship program would be offered to successful applicants to improve and increase their knowledge in cybersecurity before re-entering the workforce. 
Okey, jadi uh, banyak cabaran untuk go, uh, golongan wanita dan kita akan uh, terus uh, memperkembangkan pro, uh, career comeback program supaya kita galakkan bukan saja dalam uh, Um, cyber security risk uh, area but the other uh, career um, portfolio yang kita boleh pertimbangkan lah. Okay. Speaking to reporters after the launch of the program, Hannah also gave her assurances that participating companies would also ensure an easy transition back to the workforce with flexible working hours and childcare, among others, for these women. She added that the main objective of the program was to fill local female talents in the field to offer stable ecosystem for women after returning to the workforce, including attractive and high remuneration packages, as well as to promote and build new ideas. Labuan Airport is capable of handling any increase in flights, both domestic and international, due to its capacity and facilities. Speaking at a press conference after Malaysia Airport's Labuan Hari Raya open house in Labuan today, Airport Manager Ahmad Madin said the upgraded airport runway is also able to receive larger aircraft, such as the A320, with higher passenger loads, and the 747 cargo aircraft. Dari segi macam penerbangan, kita lihat sekarang ni jadual masih sama. Kita berharap ada pertambahan, terutamanya penerbangan antarabangsa. Yang lepas ada pernah sekali daripada China, tapi tidak kekal lama dan diberhentikan. Apabila ada penerbangan luar negara, berarti Labuan akan lebih maju lah. Labuan is currently connected via flights from Kuala Lumpur, Miri and Kota Kinabalu. Meanwhile, Malaysia Airport's Head of Overseas Venture Division Lindayani Tajudin said efforts are underway to lure more airlines to Labuan. Johor Darul Ta'zim JDT are just six points away from their sixth Super League title after edging Selangor 3-2 at the Tan Sri Hassan Yunus Stadium, Larkind, last night. Following the victory, they have a runaway lead with 43 points with five matches left to go, leaving Pahang, who are in second place, adrift 13 points in their wake after 16 matches apiece. <laughs> JDT were comparatively average in their Super League encounter last night but still did not enough to edge a poor Selangor 3-2. Playing before a vociferous home crowd, the Sound and Tigers were two up as early as the 12-minute courtesy of Gonzalo Cabrera, 10th minute, and Leandro Velaquez. Selangor midfielder Muhammad Karil Muhimin Zamri narrowed the deficit in the 41st minute from a spot kick, but JDT found their third via Muhammad Safawi Rasid. But the Red Giants are not one to give up easily, and Sandro da Silva managed to find their second at the end of the match, but it was not enough. JDT remain unbeaten and top of the table in the Super League, while Selangor remain in fourth. At the Kuala Lumpur Stadium in Chiras, Kuala Lumpur continued to remain in the relegation zone after losing nil one to Malacca. The only goal of the match came when Patrick Kala Reshlet struck dearly in the 43rd minute. The result meant Malacca United jumped to fourth place on league table. Kuala Lumpur meanwhile veers on the relegation zone on 10th place. And that concludes this evening's news on two. In our top story, Malaysia wants proof Russia took down MH17. Join me again tomorrow at 12.30 for more updates. Thanks for watching and have a pleasant evening.